message of gloom, a little bit of gloom, uh, because all, you know, we're talking about culture, artistry, it's all bits flowing over pipes at some point in its life. And I'm here to talk about the crushing market power of a very few actors in America by whose grace we get to push these bits around. And that's a big deal. And so it sounds a little technocratic and it's got this telecom jargon in it, but it is actually all about culture. So to sort of fast forward to the big finish, if we've got a single monopoly provider in each community of one pipe, the pipe, for high-speed wired access, and footnote, wireless does not compete with that. We've got um, one guy with one pipe, everything goes over it. Culture, information, news, our lives, anything we're creating, new businesses, all conditioned on what these very few actors want to see for our future. So that's where I'm heading. I want to explain to you just a little bit of how we got there, and then I'm going to shut up as quickly as possible to talk to you about this. Because I, I think this is a big uh, civil rights, you know, essential economic and industrial policy moment for America. And it's one that your generation is going to have to figure out how to solve because my generation is pretty much screwing us up. So. <laughs> okay, so um, this the, I'm writing a book and my research assistant, Shane Wagman, is here. It's called The Big Squeeze. Yay! The Big Squeeze. <laughs> it's about the uh, looming cable monopoly. And this little bit of uh, jargon on the first slide. Uh, this single wire is a natural monopoly. Nothing bad about that. It's just so expensive to install. Big upfront sunk costs, crushing economies of scale and scope, which means it costs very little to add one more person to your connection. And once you're big, you just crush everybody in your path. And steeply declining cost curves in the last mile, which means that for you, the incumbent, it's a lot cheaper to provide service than for anybody else. So it's a headline here. Uh, the reason um, I'm so focused on this is that in most, I'd say all of the large cities in America, that's a kind of kooky looking map, that is uh, Atlanta. And uh, what's that hand gesture mean? I'm from Atlanta. Oh, okay. Hello, Atlanta. <laughs> Hello, Atlanta. Yay. Um, thank you. I thought the hand gesture meant, like, shut up or something. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, uh, Comcast is the monopoly provider in Atlanta, and that yellow color is their plant. And what they're doing is encircling the urban core. In 97, the cable companies actually split up the, the country among themselves. They called this the summer of love. They all got together and said, all right, you take Minneapolis, I'll take Sacramento, let's cluster our operations because we'll all make more money that way. So Comcast is, Atlanta is really a Comcast town. And if you look down the top uh, metropolitan areas in the country, New York's a little complicated, so they divided up the boroughs. Um, but actually, in, in Manhattan, it's usually time order. But everywhere else, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, Dallas, you get a choice of one. Uh, it's, it's Comcast or Time Warner Cable, and they've just divided up the country. Right? That's remarkable in and of itself. Uh, but it, What's happened over the last few years is that uh, we're learning a lot more about what access is possible. You can now get 100 megabits per second routinely over the cable plant. They have a better technology and they invested in it and built it up all over America. Don't compete with each other. Much more expensive to upgrade a copper phone line to fiber. Copper phone lines, a traditional phone service, you have to dig up the streets, they're doing this right now in New York for Verizon, to lay files. We'd all love to see fiber. Uh, but it doesn't reach most Americans because it's so expensive to tear up the streets and put in fiber. A lot cheaper for fiber for uh, cable to make its plant two-way and to ship a whole lot of it. So up to 100 megabits per second. Just tested a, a standard cable equipment can bring you a connection of 1.3 gigs, which is a lot. And that, you know, 70 times what DSL is capable of. So, but the sad news is that wireless, where we have so, much, so many hopes, and I know there are a lot of people here from the wireless community, cannot compete with wired access because although I'm a lawyer and I believe in law, there are these laws of physics. <laughs> like, right? Like uh, Shannon's law, 
And uh, that Shannon's Law uh, tells you how much information carrying capacity any one channel has. And so that depends on a couple parameters. One is how much bandwidth from like 600 to 750 on the spectrum chart sort of analog bandwidth is available to that channel. And the other depends on how much interference is experienced by the um, receiver. So wireless is, is a really harsh environment. There isn't a lot of uh, sort of spread of analog bandwidth devoted to wireless connections. And it's like Times Square. There are all kinds of things interfering, getting in the way. Cable doesn't experience any of that. Inside the covered cable pipe is an awful lot of spectrum, a lot of information carrying capacity, and no interference. It's like a secret tunnel that no one gets to enter. So that's why it's so efficient at shipping bits back and forth. And wireless will never match the capacity of this wired data uh, channel. I know someone's going to say, oh, not never. But I'm telling you here, it's gonna, it's, it would be very hard. You'd have to be the one guy standing next to a tower with a really powerful, big battery device uh, in order to get anything like the kinds of speeds that wireless um, operators are talking about. No, not never. Not never. I knew it. I knew it. I knew someone was saying never. Okay, so low efficiency, uh, essentially low efficiency plus exponential growth in high data rate demand. Uh, the advantages I, I submit to you, I believe, that the advantages of fiber or the cable connection, which is fiber coax, will continue to grow. And wireless itself has some natural monopoly characteristics, which we can talk about in the future. But imagine two gentle markets not really competing with each other. <coughs> Verizon and AT&T go off in the wireless direction. Cable guys go off in the cable direction. And they both hang on to these markets and have huge advantages of scale and scope. And in the case of Verizon and AT&T, um, spectrum. So, legacy DSL, sorry, it really is becoming irrelevant, and, and it is so much more expensive to upgrade that than it is to upgrade uh, cable, that cable has won. And only fiber would be able to compete with the cable guys, um, and cable is adding broadband new uh, uh, people very, very quickly. So 90% of new broadband subscribers were to the cable people uh, at, over this last Oh, certainly in the second quarter of 2010, and in a bunch of quarters, cable is just growing in its, um, people really care about cable. Because we want speed. We want, actually, a lot of speed. What happened to my little, I had one more line, but that's okay. Um, for most of the country, cable faces no competition. And as more and more high bandwidth applications show up, your appetite for high data rates will just increase. Because you'll get used to it. No one ever goes back once they've experienced a very, high speed uh, connection. So the emergence of lots of high data rate applications will just push this trend along. So now what? Um, everything migrates to high bandwidth connections, but only cable can provide it. They don't compete with anybody. Uh, there's so many ways the combination of conduit and content can be abused. Because remember, this is just one big pipe with no interference in it, essentially, shipping lots of bits. And we didn't separate uh, the conduit, like the sidewalk, from the conversation. So many more companies are vertically integrated. They have their own content interests. We just saw a very large merger between Comcast and NBCU, which uh, sort of adds to this picture of the possibility of abuse. And just in <coughs> such subtle, discriminatory ways, we won't even be able to figure it out. And the FCC's net neutrality proceeding doesn't really scratch the surface of what's possible using what is essentially one big IP-enabled pipe with a little bit of it devoted to traditional internet access. Everything else may feel like internet access will be IP-enabled, but they'll be managed and prioritized and you know channeled services. Um, so lots of abuse possible. Net neutrality has very little effect on things like charging you um, for how many bits you use. And as we, your generation gets more and more used to real-time uh, video conferencing and all kinds of high-def applications, I can only imagine, uh, you'll be charged for that in a way that will be good for the cable actors, not necessarily good for you. And you can charge other networks to connect to that Atlanta circle. You know, if you want to reach my subscribers, you've got to go through me and pay. Uh, we may end up uh, remaining with quite high prices for high-speed internet access. As it is, our country is way down the rank rankings when it comes to speed and price around the world. And we've got these actors who have no competition constraining their ability to raise prices. 
So there's some giant, giant issues here that I want you to dig into and understand and write about and, you know, bother people about. Uh, the state of high-speed data competition, I think the battle is over. I think Cable really has won. And uh, so now what do we do? The state of set-top box competition, I haven't even talked about that yet, but when there's a device that merges cable, uh, traditional cable channels, which I know you guys don't care about, and I really don't either, but a lot of people do, especially for sports, um, sports and real-time news, that's all coming through a box that's controlled by the cable operator and merges internet access. That's an amazing thing. That's like a, a device that's locked to that network uh, in a way that gives it an awful lot of control. Um, potential for uh, lots of ties between offline and online content. So if you want to get access to sports online, you're going to have to pay the cable subscriber. This is the TV everywhere model. Um, and this also implicates the concentration of content companies. We've only got four, five giant conglomerates in this country that control 80% of primetime viewing hours. Again, your generation may not care so much about this high price content, but these actors have every incentive to keep things as they are and not allow a lot of disruptive uh, programming or devices or applications that will get in the way of the tens of billions of dollars that are shipped around in the current business model. And of course, there are even larger privacy issues that will come up as each wired uh, connection can be perfectly targeted at an individual. Your wireless carrier can already do this. Um, advertising based on not only your, what programs you're watching, but what your online experience is. That's remarkable. Um, and that's, I think that's quite possible given current technology, so what do we do about that? So I hope I've you know, raised your temperature or lowered it, whatever it is that's relevant to uh, <laughs> making you care about these issues because everything else rides on top of them. And they may seem kind of giant and distant like a stupid big box store on the corner, but they do have an impact on culture and on you know, business models that make it possible for people to uh, survive. So here's my story and the mental picture I want to see if I can get in your heads for um, internet access that it, it really should be a utility in this country. It should be like a giant uh, train station that serves everyone, where there's um, trains that are going to every part of America. And we don't expect that the train station has to compete. There's really only one room for one in most major cities, because it's so expensive to build it. And we expect that it'll be operated for the public, that we don't really want to see competition in trains, there's really going to be one most of the time, that's fine, but there should be competition for newsstands in the train station, and that's where the private sector should be doing its job. Um, but what the problem is, we sort of believe that we've got competition in America for high-speed internet access, and what that does is lead us to uh, higher costs for all of us as we try to pay for internet access, higher costs for the government as it tries to cover the people that won't be reached by the very central urban core of Atlanta. Right? So there are a lot of people left out of that picture, and so the government's going to have to find a way to subsidize that or pay for it, and that's expensive. Um, and also great profits for the train companies, if, they're, if they can just skim off the uh, wealthy users and leave everybody else. And what if the train company is completely unsupervised? So. Uh, and that's where we are today, I would say. Uh, there's very little constraint on what the cable providers are allowed to do. And certainly competition isn't going in the back. So, you know, it's a utility. So a railway station and its service are both a symptom and a symbol of society as a shared aspiration. Lots of S's in there. But it's, it's meaningful that uh, we, when we needed to extend electricity to everybody, it was a public undertaking to make sure it happened at reasonable rates. We have not had that kind of policy in place for internet access, and we're heading into uh, reigniting of just a natural, very expensive natural monopoly for something that's essential to all of us, as essential as breathing. Really. Not really. Okay. <laughs> you, you can breathe and not have internet access, but think about what it's like when you go to a conference and you can't get online. Oh. That kind of, oh. <laughs> think about that. All right, so that's it. I, that's my little presentation, and let's talk about that. from Susan Crawford, the internet as a series of trains.
Uh, we are, I guess, the most popular. Access, access. No, the internet's up here. There's access. Okay. Um, right. Go for the joke. Um, uh, the, the the first, uh, I guess, most popular question um, is: uh, After Pearl Harbor, Congress passed a law that gave Roosevelt the power to kill all telecommunications. Um, and S three four eight zero would add the internet to the bill. Uh, do you think the president should be able to kill internet? S3480 already got shot down, but you know. Yeah. Well, the president already has uh, remarkable emergency powers. Right. So I, I'm not sure that the bill would make that much of a difference, to tell you the truth. But it would, um, the, the administration keep saying that we are not like Egypt and that this, it would be difficult to see this happen here. So let's, let's just assume that's the case. <laughs> yes. uh, well, I guess, I guess uh, a question um, after your talk, you have us like s sufficiently you know, interested and caring about this issue. What, what is the next step for us, especially us as students? Well, I know, so I'm on the Board of Public Knowledge, and I know that they are sending around lots of petitions and want you to join up and uh, want you to learn about issues and watch what they're up to. Free Press, another active group, is having a big conference on media reform April 8th, and they're always looking for student energy. I, I think this kind of learning, um, you know, just getting together and talking about it and then marching on City Hall is a good thing to do. Uh, you know, it's hard, that one problem is that this is such a heavily lobbied political issue in Washington, and there's so much money on the other side of it that it's hard to feel effective, but over time, just as we we're affected with electricity and water and other utilities. At some point, this issue will break down. Great. Right. Um, all right, uh, Kevin asks, uh, can you say something about how the American experience compares internationally, especially with uh, open access to broadband? OK, well, um, interestingly, back at, in 96, our Congress and government decided it'd be great to make sure that that uh, conduit was open to competition, so that it is so expensive to um, install this stuff that it only makes sense for other people to, sh to show up and share it. And that's the policy we adopted in 1996. Through litigation and attrition and just weariness that broke down in the United States, but meanwhile, other countries around the world had followed our lead. So in most of the developed nations in the world, uh, there is in fact forced competition or open access, however you want to label it, that has given rise to faster speeds, lower prices, and a better competitive environment. And there's a wonderful report on this, maybe someone can post the URL, uh, from the Berkman Center in February of 2010, where they go through all the comparative evidence on speeds and costs and policy frameworks around the world. Um, let's see here. Yeah, right. Um, I think, one a quick comment and then to your question. I think the observation that it's not just about that neutrality is really important. I think net neutrality is a, is a wonderful concept and integral to this whole conversation, but it's almost too politicized, and it can sometimes, I think, distract from this larger point of like paying for bits. Like, <laughs> like that has nothing to do with net neutrality. And yeah. that leads me to my second question, which is we're all used to unlimited bandwidth right now, and that's, a, that's just a ridiculous concept, right? Like, like if you talk to a network administrator and you say the word unlimited, it doesn't make any sense to them, right? So, that was a migration off of the AOL minutes CDs. Like that was a that was a market evolution to uh, it was a reaction to the fact that minutes didn't make any sense for internet. But so now we're used to unlimited time on the internet, but not unlimited data. And the and the and the, the consumer retail internet providers are starting to squirm. They're trying to say, well, you can't you can't use BitTorrent that much or like too much too much YouTube um, and not quite not quite unlimited when you're doing this. And so they're coming up with all these. Excuses about you know it's, it's max 25 gigabytes on the iPhone now. You signed up after you know April 2008 or something. So the question is, what do you see the market reaction being to this problem? Are we going to have to start paying per terabyte per gigabyte? As an insider, how do you see it? Well, one unfortunate and unintended consequence of the net neutrality discussion was that if you if the carriers can't charge a content provider to reach an end user they're just going to turn around and charge the end user. Yeah. And that's a, there's much more emphasis these days on usage-based pricing. Big political fight in Canada about this. Oh, People yeah. going, yeah, yeah, big knot. Going up in smoke in Canada. Over, it's a, you know, 
as in Australia, these issues are becoming election issues. Someday that'll be true in America, but not so far. So, you know, what I'm hoping is that uh, people will recognize that the, the entire IP pipe for cable has, has almost unlimited capacity. It really does. It would be very difficult for people to use that up. And so if you devote more of that pipe to what we think of now as internet access, um, then these, these capacity issues really go out the window. The problem is it's so constrained, artificially constrained, by the carriers to a tiny part of what they provide. But the, even the notion of forcing a private company to think about uh, opening up its pipes to greater internet access, greater capacity, is heretical right now. Can't, it's unthinkable. That's how far away we are. All right, so we have another rising question on the back channel. Um, why has Japan, Korea, Scandinavia, and much of the EU uh, been a lot more successful on providing cheap and fast internet access? Well, it's a combination of the answer I gave, just gave, which is uh, forcing the natural monopoly, you know, dumb pipe to share its facilities with competitors means you get faster <coughs> speeds. You just do. Uh, because people innovate and create new technologies. And the other thing is that they, more, other countries have taken it on as a matter of natural, I'm sorry, national policy. It is important for our citizens, these countries say, that everybody have the fastest connection possible, that fiber be everywhere in Australia. They're investing $35 billion so that 93% of Australians will, Australians will have fiber to the home. Right? Can you imagine? Go look at some stories about Australia. We are so far away from that. It's, un again, unthinkable in, in the United States that we take this on, especially with deficits looming and so many concerns. Uh, yeah, in the middle. Yeah, you're, you're hinting, uh, you just hinted at it, but just as, could you tell us which of the various uh, people that uh, you're looking at all over the world has the very best system, and what about it strikes you as the best? What? I hear someone in the front. Germany. Germany. Tell me about Germany. Well, um, <laughs> uh, have you ever heard of, free, what is that? Uh, Fry Fry it's a... Uh, the largest, most successful mesh network, mesh in, network. All right. in Europe. Okay. And you're talking about these monopolies breaking them up. I mean, they're sort of, we have a, uh, we have a slogan at Grinnell where we're building a mesh network and we say, freak the fry. <laughs> All right, so let me but I'm, so, I'm, not, so, I'm not asking about technical types of networks. The right. I'm asking mesh what about society? Mesh which, is the best. which of the societies you look at right. has the best system for the society, and why do you think that's the case? Okay, so I want to rip off both of these things because uh, mesh is great. That mesh network, in order to get anywhere, has to hit fiber in a tower. You can communicate with people in this room, but if you want to actually ship something a distance, there's got to be fiber invested by somebody that you're able to access, right? And that's where the, the market power of these wired players is really relevant because they're the ones who control that, okay? But, but the, the national policy that makes the most sense is the, what Australia is doing, which is to say everybody gets it, uh, it with the exception of some people are too hard to reach on the coasts. We're, uh, in a sense, they're lucky because they had a monopoly player that they could break up and ask <coughs> to provide uh, this basic access. Oh. But, it's, but it's an open platform, anybody can connect to it, and uh, it's just like water electricity, something that's a sort of nat a social input for all activities. We have so many problems in education, healthcare, energy. You know, as a nation, we're just suffering. Look at the, I know you guys don't read the op-ed page of the New York Times, but there's a great uh, chart today on that page that shows on the major indicators where the U.S. is. And when it comes to things like, again, education, healthcare, energy, and from my perspective, information infrastructure, we're just way down the list. So uh, taking this fundamental question on as part of our national plan would be a good idea. And that's what Australia's done, and that's what a bunch of the Northern European countries have done, and Asia as well. Uh, what about you over there? Yeah. Oh, another one of my research assistants, Mr. Eric Knoll, is in the house. <laughs> um, you mentioned the usage-based billing thing yeah. in Canada. I was wondering if you thought that would have any impact on Oh, it's already here. Well, I mean, do you think that, that backlash would have an impact on ISPs or on the FCC? Well, our expectations are pretty low right now. So, um, you know, you have to really 
feel that you were missing something through the imposition of usage-based pricing. And I'm, I'm not sure that we're ready, we're, that we're already experiencing the open living room, the kind of idea of endless connectivity that's possible. And so if we've never experienced that, it's hard to have a backlash. And frankly, Americans aren't very good at backlash. <laughs> right now, I was in some cab, you know, there's pouring rain. The cab driver says, you Americans, you never march in the streets. You never do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe they are in Wisconsin, you know, today, that there's a little bit of protesting going on. But it, it, we don't usually rise up, and particularly not about telecommunications policy. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Um, what about, go for it. Thank you. Hey. Um, first of all, I just want to make a quick plug. Um, I'm going to be talking to John Bergmeier um, from Public Knowledge about this at South by Southwest. And we're specifically, I'm going to be talking about, from a content creator's perspective, what um, is important about these issues. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that um, from independent content producer's perspective. Why is this important? Well, the assumption from the media conglomerates and the cable operators who work very closely together is that there will be no big model in online video, for example, that will disrupt their plans. You may remember the Writers Guild went on strike in 2008 at a cost of billions of dollars to their members. Well, the Directors Guild did not object to uh, new schemes for online content because they really don't assume it's going to be a big marketplace because they can see all these very few players <laughs> lining up with each other and it, it, there's no real disruption coming in terms of like big dollars, advertising, subscription that would disrupt their plans. So maybe that gets to people uh, sort of going for the jugular that they, they assume that who doesn't really have a business plan now and there won't be anybody else later and it'll be very difficult for independent creators to get wide enough distribution, like tens of millions of people, that will allow them then to attract the advertising dollars which make the model work. Because it really does come down to the economics of it. We think that technology and creativity will always just emerge and float and do really well, <laughs> but there has to be there has to be a business model, and sometimes there needs to be some government intervention to keep the old media players from getting in the way of the new ones. All right. You like All that? Right. <laughs> Over there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joe Block, and Susan knows that we've been, as one of us, as an independent ISP, until a few weeks ago, we fought these battles uh, and lost uh, at the FCC. Um, what what I want to just add on what you said to make explicit what Susan is talking about. Think of the notion of hosting your own server if you're an independent content creator or you, you create a new application. Everybody should have the ability for two-way uh, real-time communications, whether it's video conferencing or some new innovation. The Comcast of the world have every incentive and, and the means to stifle that, whether that's blocking BitTorrent, whether it's Verizon putting a, a little delay in any voice over IP application so that it sounds like crap and you don't know why, you just, you'll blame, well, I guess I can't use Skype, I'll have to go back to my Verizon landline. They have a business uh, a rationale for doing that. So that's the kind of thing that, that is lost in this. You, you don't have the freedom to get up maybe a public IP address, or to host your own server, and, and that's really a matter of free speech, as well as being uh, uh, the innovation platform that we've, we've seen so far. Uh, in the back. So Joe, Joe and I may see some similar actions. I'm also a DSL customer. I was with Speakeasy. I still with Speakeasy, but obviously they merged and yeah, have not gone for the better. But um, I think realistically, what you're talking about, um, at least for the next few years, doesn't look very promising in the current climate that we're dealing with. Wisconsin being an example, there's a strong backlash to government interaction with any kind of private infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of union busting going on. Um, I had a great conversation with a friend last night about it, whose father used to organize unions. He organized one himself, got fired for it. Realistically, what can we do to put forth this effort to try and get equality on the wires? And what is realistically the time frame where we might see some success? Because things are looking real good right now for the, uh, the public side. For the progressives. Well, in 1974, during the Nixon administration, it, you know, staffed by a young Justice Scalia, a bunch of cabinet officers wrote a memo to the president saying, 
for the new cable industry, this is 1974, just cable just started, we must separate content from conduit. There's so many potential ways to mess with our future as a company, as a country, uh, that you've got to make sure that the cable actors can't also discriminate. That effort did not succeed in a you know, conservative administration. Your charge is to figure out how to reach out to people across the aisle, on the right and in the Tea Party, to say, look, the free market doesn't work. Free market doesn't work if we don't have a level playing field for communication. And, you know, and this happened in the progressive area. In 1912, a whole bunch of rock group Republicans said, we hate the way the railroads are run. We hate the way the utilities discriminate against our you know, oil shipments. And we, we're not going to let that happen. It's not, it's not a left-right issue. It's, a, it's the free market. We don't have one in culture or in communications. So, okay, realistic time frame. I'm thinking uh, 2014, new uh, Communications Act. We have to get Mr. Obama reelected. Yeah. And then we have to thank you. Very good. We do because it's going to get easier to work on these issues uh, in the second term. What's plan B? Oh, wait. Plan B. When the market crashed and we had the depression, FDR started working on the CCC idea. Right. The, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And if any of you have not learned about the CCC, go to PBS on their website. You can stream American Experience. They have a whole episode on it. It's very fascinating. But people were in the streets over that because of socialism, the same way they went out against Obama. Right. This is the 30s. FDR did it, and it was great, and we benefited from it. FDR also did electrification. Yeah. People did, did not go out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. FDR did do that again. Oh, okay. Well, here's, 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 a yeah, so. here's a plan B. The plan B is municipal networks. Yeah. It's not waiting for the exactly. broken federal government to do its thing, but to encourage every local community to find a way to operate its own fiber, put up its own fiber network that can be open. It's difficult because in 18 states, the incumbents have already passed legislation making it impossible to do this. Uh, but at working on a local level to uh, make sure that wherever you are, Ann Arbor, Ithaca, you know, every town in America should have fiber to all of its schools and libraries to which other competitors can attach. And so that's a plan B. Okay. Oh, I got a clap. Yeah, yeah. That's a plan B. <laughs> that's a plan B. Um, I got to stop soon. Yeah. Uh, uh, one last question. Once again, who has... Oh. <laughs> 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 People in the Tea Party and people in the Liberty Movement, which is taking over the Republican Party, the Ron Paul, like the Ron Paul Republican Party, are they want to see open data, they want to see open access to the internet, and they don't trust corporations because, like you said, and I think this is something that we need to get clear in the messaging, we do not have a free market now, so you can't blame the flaws that exist now on a free market if this isn't a free market. So if we move the conversation from, you know, we need to rely on the government. Two, Plan B, which is what everyone in, you know, the Liberty CPAC movement was talking about, which is that we need to take over our state governments, which are run by people who are not good at what they do. We need to take over municipal governments, and we need to seek a local solution to these challenges. Because if we wait for the federal government, the corporations already own it. The the players, like it's already been corrupted. That we need to, you know, if we want to work on on federal channels, that's cool. But the the, the primary thing we have to do is. Yeah, I guess, I guess the answer is municipal fiber, because the, the, the primary message from the liberty people, the liberty movement within the Republican Party, within the, within, at CPAC, within the Republican Party, is get local now because the big guys already own all of the, all of the, the federal players. So I think that there, I think this is a huge opportunity for a bipartisan, or you know, trans, political, left, right, Ralph Nader, Ron Paul, Kucinich, all the, McKinney, all the, all the classes, yeah. to come together and say like, yeah, internet access is, you know, even if, even the, the, the most anarchic libertarians recognize that roads are an essential element for government, government needs to do roads. Maybe not a lot of stuff, but roads. And that these pipes, whatever we want to call the, this internet access, is, you know, is, is something that we can work with the government to do. But we, unless we're empowered locally, 
we're going to have no power on the negotiating table. Sir, you sound like uh, some prescient congressman when, uh, in 1934 when they were debating if radio should be available to everybody. And they made it available and then created the FCC, the Telecommunications Act, 1934. And I think it serves as a great historical precedent. And while we all should, you know, fight and advocate to protect the Internet and make sure it's available to every American. Yeah, the mesh networking is key, I think, in terms of empowering the American people to recognize that, like, we can do stuff ourselves. We can get that signal from, like, groups of people organizing in a local manner. So, I don't know. I mean, could you talk more about, uh, kind of like what the municipal, the local option is? So the great this? site on this, uh, muninetworks.org, has uh, lists of all the uh, municipal networks. There's going to be a new map up there, what's going on. They face lots of battles. Just this week, the North Carolina legislature passed a law making it very difficult to build uh, municipal broadband there. But you know, and there's a there's a big uh, cohort of people out in America who are working on this, but they're struggling. Chattanooga, oh my god, they put a 100 megabit fiber built on the um, uh, the power, the electrical grid, right? So pre-existing infrastructure, string fiber along it. They're seeing 100 megabit speeds to everybody in Chattanooga, and businesses are moving to Chattanooga yeah, in order to operate there. What's that? You want? Yeah, move to Chattanooga. Get down there. Right there. Move to right. Chattanooga. That was awesome. All right. Uh, <laughs>